right, we're going to continue on this morning in Ephesians chapter 3. Going to actually wrap up that chapter today. Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, I came across a quote this last week as I was studying for this. I want to read it to you, and I hope it hits home with you like it did with me. It is possible to know a great deal about an automobile, to know exactly how the engine, the ignition, the transmission, and so on operate, and yet never, uh, never use it to go anywhere. It's also possible to know very little about an automobile and yet use it every day and travel hundreds of miles. In the same way, it is possible to know a great deal about the Bible, its doctrines, interpretations, moral standards, promises, warnings, and so on, and yet not live by those truths. Ouch, right? It's possible to know this word, but not obey it. See, it's, it's my goal here at Emmanuel that not only I, but you too will begin to obey everything you understand in this book. Amen? Everything the Holy Spirit reveals, you obey and follow what it, does, what it says to do. That's the goal of every Christian. It's, it's going to have to be that way if you ever reach toward maturity, is obedience. Knowing what you know, and he, trust me, most of us in this room know a lot more than we actually do, right? Come on, you're Baptist, you know what I'm talking about. But we know a lot more than we actually live out. You see, the, all these instructions in this Word wasn't just for our entertainment. It's not just for our 30 minutes on Sunday morning. It's for our daily 24-7 lives, isn't it, church? It's for that. It's for that to live triumphant. As a matter of fact, you will never understand or experience the abundant life until you start obeying that Word. God's not going to let you experience the joy of the abundant life if you don't obey Him, right? He's not going to let you see further than you will see in disobedience if you don't obey Him. If you start obeying Him, you'll begin to what? See more in this. This is a living book. Y'all know that, right? As you read it and continue to read it, suddenly you go, Whoa, I never saw that before, right? It's living. It will begin to reveal itself to you. As a matter of fact, God says, The more you dig, the more I'll reveal. The more you seek, the more you'll find. It's not like, okay, I'm just going to sit here and wait for you to hand it to me. No, it's a lot of work involved in the church to go after it, to seek it, and use this book right here to find him, amen? And to understand he's within us. Well, Paul's going to show the Ephesian church today. He's got a, a verse here, the prayer for the Ephesians, starting in uh, chapter 3, verse 14. And I want you to pay attention to this prayer. It's got a lot of good points to it here. He said, for this reason I kneel before the Father from whom the, his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's a, that's a pretty short prayer, isn't it? But there's a lot packed in there. The first thing I want us to see that's packed in there is the very first thing he says, for this reason, what reason? Chapter 1 through chapter 3, up to where we are. For those reasons, go back and you look at the reasons of why he wrote this book. You'll see that there, there's the church uh, becoming a glorified, a different group of people, Jew and Gentile becoming one, the mystery of Christ. For this reason, for the reason that God saved you, chose you, for that reason, for the reason that he's making the church bring glory to him, for that reason, right? So go back through 1 and 3 and you'll see for this reason what that actually means. And he's saying for this reason that he's praying for specific things. For this reason he's praying for power. First and foremost, you see the word power in there a number of times, don't you? Praying for this power that we need in this life. The prayer is for specific reasons. The prayer was so important it drove Paul to his knees. Now I want to look at that in just a moment. Does God answer your prayer more when you're on your knees or when you're standing or when you're laying flat on your face? Doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter. The situation that you're in most of the time calls for the position of prayer that you'll take. If you're desperate to seek God's face, you're going to be desperate to touch his heart. You may take a position to lay him flat out on the floor. I don't know how many of y'all pray like that. 
prostrate on the floor, right? <laughs> to get out laid out like that before God. Look, that's not, that's not uncommon. We won't see it in here, and I'm most likely because it's kind of hard getting up off this floor. But there's kneelers. You can kneel, right? There's places. And look, in the, in the New Testament, the beginning, in the day of Jesus, they would stand and do this. Not even close their eyes. They don't, like we Baptists have a, you know. They stand and do this. Look up to the heavens, hands wide open, arms wide open, and pray to the Father, right? They pray to God. Jesus. We see Abraham praying. Stand, we see David standing. And pray, or sat, he sat in the temple and prayed. We see Abraham praying in a different uh, form, in a different way. We see Ezra falling on his knees, praying for the, his nation to repent, praying for God to have mercy. We see different positions and different uh, reasons for doing that, but as you look at the prayer positions, they're really not going to make any difference as to how your prayer gets answered. God just wants us to do what? Come to him and pray, right? Come to him. Stand, eyes open, eyes closed, on your knees, on your face, whatever. Whatever position is not the important. The importance is come to him and pray. Come to him and pray. That prayer makes a difference. It'll make a difference not on your life, but in situations around you because he's sovereign. He's in control of all that. And praying to him will make those differences also. Uh, as, as I said before, Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah by standing before the Lord. David prayed about the building of the temple. He sat before the Lord, right? And then there's, uh, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus did what? He fell on his face before God. We see Jesus wrestling. We see pictures of him kneeling on a, and leaning on a stone, but I have a feeling he was flat out on the ground and bleeding or, or sweating like drops of blood that day. He anguished for what was going on. Paul, we even studied this in Acts 20, said Paul met with those elders at Ephesus for the last time. He knelt down and prayed with them. He was at anguished at heart because he had to leave them. And he knelt and prayed. I don't know which position you use. All I ask you to do this is just like God said, just keep praying. I don't care what position you use. It's not important. The important thing is to talk to God, to, to pray to God. He addresses the Father in this. He addresses Jesus Christ came into the world to reveal God. He, just, he addresses the Father in this. Thing. He said, For this reason I kneel before the Father, he said, from whom a whole family in heaven on earth derives its name. The whole family. Notice that word whole. What he's talking about is everybody in the past and everybody in the future and everybody in this present. We're all the family of God, bottom line. Every believer, even in Abraham's day, those who believe by faith and, and follow God. In, in our day, in this dispensation after the cross, everybody that believes and follows God, surrenders to Jesus Christ, they are the same family as that family. We're all the family of God. And one day we're going to have a big old happy homecoming, right? It's coming. And those behind us, if we stay here another three, four hundred years, every child born behind us that receives Christ as their Savior, they are in that family also. There's coming a day, though, when the church will be taken up, that God's family will be stopped, if you will. This moment, this dispensation of how we enter the family of God is going to be stopped. We know that there's going to be some in the, tribu the great tribulation that will give their life for Christ. They will be saved by death, giving their life, standing for Christ during the great tribulation. It'd be a different dispensation then. They're going to actually die for the Lord and speaking for the Lord. And they were re received that way. But he prays, number one, for his first request is the strength of power of the inner man, the inner being. Every one of us in this room has an inner man. Amen? We have the outer man. That's not what God's saving. He's saving the inner man. Who's the inner man? Mind, will, emotion. Everything that we are is being saved. Our, we call it our soul, Right? But that soul had to be awakened. We were once dead in our sins, and what? Christ did what? He wakened us up, didn't he? He, 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 got, he made us alive. Even Paul says in Galatians, he says, I live, but not I that live, but Christ lives in me. He said, I died. I was crucified with him. And Paul understood what death meant to his sinful body and what life meant to his spirit within. Who do we feed when we're feeding the word of God into us? We're strengthening who? The inner man, not our flesh. Flesh hates the Bible, trust me, all right? He hates the Word of God. We strengthen the inner man, and that inner man is who we are actually and what we, how we walk by the inner man. So you've got to feed him. You've got to feed him, number one. He's, he's asking for strength and for power. Strength, the word strength itself uh, means to make uh, strong, tough, enduring. The word power means a force like dynamite. Dunamé is the, is the word they use in the Greek. It's dynamite. When we understand dynamite, when you light it, it's pretty powerful, isn't it? 
You can blow stumps out of the ground. You can blow cars all to pieces. You can blow everything up with dynamite. That kind of dynamite, that kind of dynamite power is the kind of power that God put in us to make us alive, right? The power that resurrected Christ from the grave is the same power dwelling within us to give us life, even in this life, to give us this life. So we see that strengthening power coming to us by Christ, and he's praying for this. Why do we need that kind of power? It's the number one, it's the only way we can overcome the flesh, the sinful nature. You're not going to overcome flesh with flesh. It doesn't work. The world tries it that way. Well, let's just pump more money into the flesh. Pump more money into this. Pump it in. we'll, we'll fix this problem by pumping more money. It doesn't fix it, does it? What fixes the flesh? Death does, doesn't it? <laughs> That's what fixes the flesh. The power of God, the Spirit of God in us, it helps us to overcome that sinful nature with all the weaknesses we may have. We overcome it by the power of God. Now, it's interesting that, that we sometimes want to try to fix flesh with flesh, and we'll go to the flesh to try to fix flesh, and we'll just keep wrestling, keep wrestling. We never overcome it. Also, it's the only, one, only way the believer can lay claim to the blessings of God and fulfill God's eternal purpose for his life. Without the power of God in us, we're powerless, bottom line. I heard it once said that, that most churches could meet together and uh, continue on without the Holy Spirit could withdraw from them. They'd never know the difference. Because they're not depending on the Holy Spirit. They got money, they got buildings, they got this, they got programs, and they just keep on meeting just like nothing ever happened. If the Holy Spirit withdrew, they wouldn't know it because they depend on the power of what they can do. I can tell you right now, the day after the rapture, Sunday after the rapture, some churches are going to be full. Some pastors may still be standing in their pulpits because they're religious. They don't have a relation. That's why I stress this, folks. Not just me, you too. We have to have that relationship, that personal one-on-one -on -one with Jesus Christ. It's not about being a member of this house. It's not about being here every Sunday. Amen, we want to do that. But it's about having him and knowing him. Because what does God say to those on that judgment day when he looks at them and they say, we did this in your name, we did that in your name, we, we kicked out demons, we did this, I gave 40% of my income, and God goes, what? I never what? Knew you. He never says, ah, you didn't have your membership in the right church. He didn't say, you're the right color, you're the right nation, you're the right, no. He said, I don't know who you are. That pretty well throws a blanket over everything, doesn't it? It throws a blanket over all humanity that he didn't know you. And that word know is not just casual, hey, how you doing? It's an intimate relationship with him. It's more intimate than any human being can be with another human being. It's agape intimacy, right? It's absolutely God's type intimacy. And you've got to have, you need to have that personal relationship. You need to understand that, that in the end, that's the only thing that counts. It will be the only thing that counts. Did you have that relationship what did you do with the life I gave you? What did you do with that eternal life I gave you while you were walking around down here? What did you do with it? That's where your treasures will be stored in that point. Also notice he, he moves on here and he says uh, uh, that, that God loves us. There's no other, uh, one other thing, how, how do we know we, he, God hears our answer to our prayer? Good one here. Is because he loves us and he will supply with us his glorious riches that are in heaven are at our disposal. Our disposal. It's like call upon him. He's not, not, and I don't understand that to say, I'm going to call on God and get me a million bucks next month. It won't happen, right? <laughs> not gonna, if you can't manage five, you're not going to be able to manage a million, right? God knows that. He knows what you can handle. He gives you what you can be blessed with and bless other people with. But he's not a big old cha-ching in the sky. You know, I'm going to get my million out of God. He's going to owe me or what? No, don't never approach him in that manner. But understand that he loves us. He will answer those prayers. Uh, that's the reason he will strengthen us with the power through his spirit. The power through his spirit. And he will answer those prayers because he loves us. And because you love him. The more you know him, the more you understand about him, the closer you will draw to him. Amen? It's a love like that. You, you cannot have a long distance love relationship with God. It's got to be close, folks. It's got to be close and endure and, and, and daily. It, it just, just put it in this sense right here. If you had a long-distance relationship with your, let's say your fiancé, your girlfriend, wife, whatever, and you never saw each other, then guess what? You'd grow not so fond of each other anymore, right? Do it over a year, and you'd be meeting a stranger in 300-something days, right? Because we change. We, we move through life. We change. But if you're there daily, on a daily basis, not 24-7 necessarily, but daily basis, in touch, in communication, you're going to grow with each other. That love won't fall apart. 
Amen? It'll stay together. It'll stay stronger and get stronger because the relationship is an ongoing thing. And it moves throughout the life with you. Now notice here in 17, he says, um, he says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may grow in power together with all the saints to grasp how wide deep. I don't want to go that far. But anyway, 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now he's talking to a bunch of Christians. Why is he saying that Christ may come in? He's not saying come in your heart, right? They're already saved. That Christ may dwell, and the dwell is the key word right there. Because in our lives, Christ doesn't want to just camp out. He's making a dwelling place. As a matter of fact, our lives need to invite him so much and be so ready for him that he feels comfortable coming and dwelling within us. He's setting up house in you, folks. That's the bottom line. He's going to dwell. He's not going to just check in once in a while and, you know, check with you. He wants to live. He's dwelling there. And we know he does that by the Holy Spirit because he said, I got to go and I'm going to send the comforter to you and he's going to dwell. He's going to be in you. God said, I'm doing a new thing. I'm going to dwell within my people. I'm, and that's what we are as a church today. God in us. Amen. Not just God with us. Amen. God is in us by the Holy Spirit. We are the body of Christ. He dwells in us by the Holy Spirit. God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three, one, right? In us. In us. Matter of fact, even Jesus told his people back in his day, he told his disciples, you want to find the kingdom of God? Don't look out there, out there. Look, we're right here, right? The kingdom is within you, within you, and salvation is within you. So he says, look, the indwelling presence of God is going to come with those who make room for him. Now you can get saved, now get this, you can get saved and never set your house up for Christ, and he won't indwell you any more than the day you got saved. Now, you're secured, you're saved for eternity, but you have no growth in your life. You have no victory in your life. He's, dwell he's, in, he's there, but he's not dwelling. At the, and dwelling is the important part here. The opening up our life, the gathering all that we can get from the Scripture, lining our lives up with the Scripture, and then he becomes even stronger. How do, how do you get filled with the Spirit? It's not necessarily a prayer, it's an action. How do you get the bucket more full? Get rid of the sin. You get rid of the rocks and more can come in, right? You get rid of the sin in your life, you become more and more full. You start walking in the fullness of being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's an action. We do something, the Spirit begins to fill up that vessel even more. You've got to get the junk out of it, right? So the Spirit can move freely. We can pray all we want to, but if we want to continue playing with our sin, the Holy Spirit is still being what? He's still constricted to work in our lives the way He wants to. So it's really up to us to be able to say, okay, I, you can only have so much Holy Spirit, you can have it all. And that's what God wants. That's where the fullness comes in right there, the fullness of Christ. But his indwelling presence is, is uh, interesting that we, we actually allow or disallow how much indwelling he's going to do. Now, you know, like I said before, you're saved, you're covered, you're saved, you're done. But the, we're talking about growing. We're talking about maturing. And that's what Paul's asking the Ephesians church. I'm praying for your what? Maturity. You're already saved. You're going to head toward maturity? You've got to understand what dwelling, indwelling means. And he says, Christ in his fullness indwelling you. Total, we call it today just basically total surrender. I am dead. I'm crucified with Christ. Yet not I live. He lives in me. Really? Could you prove it? <laughs> right? <laughs> Can you prove it to yourself? That's a pretty important question. Do you know within your knower, if you will, that he's indwelling and operating and moving and, and calling the shots in your life, if you will? He wants to indwell in that way. As a matter of fact, to, to em, embrace, our, to totally control our complete mind, will, and emotion, our whole spirit. That's what he wants. Full control of that. Then you are totally sold out, bottom line. It's interesting in Genesis 18, the angels visit Abraham. Remember that story? And there's three of them. And Abraham and Sarah both know in Genesis 18 that it's this angel, that angel, and it's the Lord. They recognize him. Christ, yeah, even before he was born, right? Christ, right there with those angels. And what happens in 18? They sit and they have time with Abraham. They have fellowship with Abraham. The two angels and the Lord himself is at home in Abraham's tent, right? What happens in 19? Jesus doesn't go to Sodom, does he? He doesn't go get Lot. He just sends the angels out there. Let them go get him. Uh, you, you've got to think, why didn't he go ahead and go into Sodom with those angels? Why didn't Christ feel at home in Lot's house? Because Lot would be what we call a carnal Christian today. He's living in the world. He's of that world, but he's still a believer. And Jesus is like, I'm not at home in his house. 
You two angels go warn him. Go get him out of there. And Christ himself didn't even go to visit with Lot in Sodom. He hung out with Abraham. He, he sat down and he fellowshiped with Abraham. But he wouldn't go to Sodom in Lot's house. I can bring that up into 2022. Are you a Lot? Are you an Abraham? Is your house comfortable for God? Or is there some stuff we got to get rid of? Is there some stuff we got to take care of? Is there some stuff in our own lives we got to get rid of so that he feels comfortable coming and sitting and talking and laughing and whatever with us, right? Like he did Abraham. But he wouldn't go to Sodom. Are we a Sodom or are we an Abraham's tent? It's up to us, folks. It really is. It can, it can go either way with you. It's up to you. Faith is not something in the Bible that we're talking about here with faith with Abraham, faith with Lot. It's not something that says, I, I hope so. I really hope it works out. I hope it, no, it's a fact. When you look at faith in the Bible and you look at our faith in Jesus Christ, it's really a, I believe by fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. Right? How do you know that, Brother Andy? Because I got the factual book right here. And it says he's coming again. And it said he's done a lot of things that happen exactly the way he said they're going to happen. And there's a few, few more things that need to happen before he comes, right? But I know it's coming. Why? Because I believe that by fact. Because my faith is actually fact. I know there's a place he's preparing for me in heaven. Why? How do I know that? He said it. He said it. And I'm not going by my old preacher that used to say, uh, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. No, God said it, said it, that settles it, whether I believe it or not. I've got to get my belief lined up with God, not his facts with what I think or how I feel. We line ourselves up with a fact of what the Word of God says. We look at this book as pretty much literal, right? I mean, we're looking at it going, yep, that's going to happen. Yep, that happened. Yep, that story's true. Yep, right? If you don't read this book, if you don't read the Bible saying, well, I'm not too sure I believe that story's real or that parable's effective, or, then you're going to start dividing this word up and saying some of it's true, some of it's not. You might as well throw the whole book away. Amen? If you're going to start reading it that way, and trust me, I say that because in the Southern Baptist Convention, we started getting into that argument about 30 years ago. Is it infallible? Is it absolutely correct? Yeah, it is. Whether or not you can believe or understand what's in there is not the problem. I mean, that is the problem, obviously. What's in there is absolute. It's going to happen. It's clear as day. It's clear as day how we're to follow God. It's clear as day the, the rule that was outlined for us. It's clear as day what Christ did on the cross, the atoning sacrifice that he paid for us. Because if it wasn't clear as day, where is your animals? Right? We don't do that. He paid the price for it all. We don't come slaughter our animals here anymore. We don't bring grain offerings. We don't do all this. We don't, we don't live by that law because he fulfilled that law for us. He fulfilled salvation. You don't earn it. You accept it. You believe it, and it's given to you. So we see he's asking them for the indwelling presence of God. Third request in verse 17 is the love. He requests the love of God. That's agape love. I said it just a moment ago. It's God kind of love. We don't have that love unless we have God in us. Amen? It can be work its way through us if we allow it to. It can infiltrate our lives and be pushed out to people around us. Agape love is very unconditional. Y'all, everybody in here been unconditionally loved? You have by God, but maybe not by your friends, right? There's always a condition to somebody's love, somebody's acceptance, a condition. But with God, there's no condition. He loves us, accepts us just like we are, agape love. And that love is extended toward every man. Now, understand this. He's even extending that agape love to those who curse him and hate him, to his enemies. Now, that's hard for us to wrap our head around. I realize that. But he's extending that love to them. He extended it to you, and you said, yes, I accept. Yes, I want the yes, Lord. Yes, yeah, save my soul. Right. But he's also extending that to the people who hate his guts, who hate us, who hate everything about what he did, who hate the church, hate everything Jesus ever did. He's still extending that love, agape, to them, saying, come, come. John 3, 16 is proof of that. Amen. He loved us the world so much he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, not just Baptists, Assembly of God, Pentecostals or anything, white or black, whosoever would believe can come and be saved. Boom, big old blanket thrown over the whole of all mankind to say, come. But he also warns, he says, you know what, that, nar that road is narrow. When you accept that invitation, it narrows down real tight, doesn't it? And that way is narrow. He said, great is the road to destruction. 
The world's on that road. They're on that path. It's wide, and there's a bunch of people following it. But when you come to Christ, boy, it narrows down, doesn't it? It comes down to a tight path. It comes down sometimes even to a treacher, more treacherous path with stumbling blocks, all kinds of stuff in it to make you build your character and make you who you are, make him who you, he wants you to be. It's not a smooth road, is it, church? You know, I'm talking to the choir here, right? This Christian life is not a smooth road. Not everything's all fixed up for you and going to be lovely, right? You're still going to go through this world. You're going to deal with this junk here, this flesh. You're going to deal with your mind being set in the world set and not completely transformed into the mind of Christ because that day's coming when flesh, when mortality will be changed to immortality and our minds will be completed, right? And sin will no longer have that effect on us because all we've known is sin. All we've known is living in this and not what's coming. But what's coming is going to be glorifying, is going to be glorifying to God because he loves us. He set that up that way. Not only that, he shows in verse 18 the understanding. It's the fourth request is understanding, a full understanding of all spiritual things. And th this is the verse where he puts this in. He puts in there about the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of love. We can understand the breadth of God's, the breadth, I can't say it, reflecting in God's acceptance of Gentile and Jew equally in Christ. All of it's right here in Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 1, 11 through 18. His breadth of his love is accepting Jew and Gentile together, making a new thing out of us, right? That's, that's, how, that's how breadth, the deep, and then the length of it, of God's choosing us before the foundation of the world. Verse 1, 4 through 5, for salvation that will last all eternity. We have been chosen from the very beginning of time. To be what? Transformed, to be made in the image, be like Christ. To, to predestined to head in that direction. From the foundation of time, from the very beginning, God knew this was going to be happening. He didn't tell the Old Testament prophets. He didn't let them see it. But he knew the church was coming. He knew you and I were going to be here today. That's, I know that's hard to wrap our heads around too. It's like, wow. He knows it all, doesn't he? Past, present, and future. He knows what's coming up. Because that's his sovereign. That's where he's sovereign in that area, knowing what's happening, what's coming up. But he, he uh, understands that from the foundation of the world, that salvation will be provided for us. We can see his love's height in God's having blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, raising us up and seating us with Christ. The height is unmeasurable. All those four things that it points out are unmeasurable. As far as, and when he says, I forgive your sins, as far as what, east and west? That's a great illustration because if you head east, you're going to keep heading east. You're going to keep going around and around heading east. You head west, you're going to keep heading west the whole time. Everything's going to be west. Do north and south, you run into the end of that eventually. North, and then you're heading south, right? But east and west is a continual thing. Isn't that weird that the Bible would even bring that up way back then to say that to us, that your sins are forgiven as far as the east is what you'll never see them again? God said, I take care of them when you ask for forgiveness. So his, his length, his, his height is from the heavens to wherever. And the depth of his love is basically in God reaching down to the lowest levels of depravity to redeem those who are dead in trespasses and sin. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. That's how deep it goes. It literally goes into the pits of hell if it has to to pull somebody to salvation. It goes that deep. And we think about where we were in our lives, depraved, totally depravity, right, of man. We're totally without God, totally wasn't looking for God, running from God, most of us. And he does what? He reaches down and says, come. We turned around and said, oh, there you are, right? Yeah, I believe. I receive. And the Holy Spirit drew us. Our eyes were open. We were enlightened to what was going on, and we received that salvation. We couldn't say no to it. It's an offer too good to refuse, amen? And when he offered it to us, it's like, yes, I'll take it. But there's millions upon millions of people who say, absolutely, no, I don't believe in you. I don't want it. I got this on my own, and they will stand before him one day and say, hey, I thought I could earn this. And he said, I don't know who you are. Step aside. Step aside. If it's our neighbor, we hope not. Amen? We want to be able to tell them what's going on. Jesus Christ love. The fifth request to know love in verse 19. To know his love and it surpasses knowledge. Now, how can you know love that surpasses knowledge? Only by God. <laughs> Bottom line. You're never going to study enough to understand that love it surpasses that kind of knowledge. That you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. He's saying here in the love in this is again agape love. Knowing the fullness of Christ. Knowing his love. And understanding his love. And eventually, get this, you and I can operate in that love. As more we surrender, as more we are filled with him and 
uh, and, and, and ruled by his Holy Spirit and by his kingdom within us, that agape, that, that, that non-conditional love would go out not just to the body, to each other, it would go out to those folks who don't know him. And they'll say, man, why are you such a, a loving, you know, I feel something from, they'll recognize this, I feel something from you I've never felt from any other human being. It's a, it's a deep concern and compassion that I have, nobody's ever shared with me. And they just know it. And then when they hear that, if you ever hear that said to you, you go, that's not me, dude. That's not my love for you. That's God coming through me. That's God coming through me. You are a conduit, if you will, of God's love. You're the highest generator of, of power that God has walking this earth. And he conducts through you that power at given moments, that love. And it's, it's represented as power to other people. It comes out that way. So he shows that kind of, there's a song I've sung here before uh, called uh, The Love of God. It says, it says the, and I quote the verse, Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song, written in 1917. Y'all believe that? <laughs> we still sing it today. It's a beautiful song. It's in our hymn, well, the hymn book, right? The love of God. It's un unmeasurable. It's, it's how wide, how strong, how deep it is. And we could, we, the ocean, we'd use up all the ocean water trying to write it all out. You see, that's hard to wrap around, too. But God's love is so vast and so much supply of it that we can't fathom that. Not only his love, but his available riches to us. He gives out of his, of his wealth to his people, to his church, to those who follow him in order that we may be blessings, not only to each other, but to the whole world, but what he's given us. And understanding this love is wrapped up in John 15, 13, when he says, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. John understood it. He saw it. Romans 5, 8, and 10 says this. For God demonstrates his own love in us, uh, for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Saved meaning a continual salvation to that very moment when we're finally glorified. We're heading for glorification. Y'all know that, right? We're in that sanctification part. We're in that tough part right now. We're in the sanctification. We have believed we are following, and, and every day God's taking something and just and knocking it off of everything that's not like Christ, making us more like him because we are predestined to become like him. Amen? And so everything that is not like him has to be basically flushed out, knocked out, whatever, however you want to look at it, surgically removed, if you will, spiritually removed, from us to make us more like Christ. And when he's done, he says, come on home. Come on. Come on home. We call that death now, right? He says, come on. But what it is is just stepping across into eternal life. Because you and I, we're not going to die, folks. <laughs> we're going to die like they die here. But we're going to live forever. We're going to be with him. We step across that moment. It's, it's an actual event that takes place in our life. We've got to go through death to get there. Unless he comes today, right now, and says, come up. Come on. Then those in the graves will rise first, and those of us who are still standing left behind will come up, meet him in the air right behind them. And at that moment, right, mortality becomes immortality. We're changed in the, whatever a twinkling of an eye is. It's pretty quick, isn't it? it? It's all done so fast you won't even realize it happened to you. So he's, he's saying this love is, is given for the people of God. It's given for them. We need to understand that. He's praying for that for them. That number, and look at the last of 19, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's the sixth request he's laid out here. The Amplified New Testament says it this way. That you may be filled through all your being unto all the fullness of God, that is, may have the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. We know what a flood is, right? Flooded with God, you know what that's saying basically? Let my cup runneth over, Right? Let my cup run away. You want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Take care of your sin. Get rid of your sin problems, and the Holy Spirit will automatically begin to swell and fill and overflow. It's not a continual come back and fill me again type thing. He's there. Just make room for him, and he'll fill you. 
Make room for him and he'll work, he'll work his work in you. Make room for Christ and he'll actually set up his couch in your life. Amen. He'll sit there and have fellowship with you. He'll, he'll make his dwelling. He won't just visit. He won't just feel like he's there once in a while. You'll recognize he's there all the time because he's dwelling and fellowshipping with you. To understand God's fullness, his six requests, we need to understand that that's an, in the, in the Holy Spirit within us bringing about that fullness. We'll understand his fullness by understanding his word. Having a hunger, going after it, seeking, knocking, finding, right? Because here within this word is the fullness of Christ in us. The more that word you put in you, guess what? The less sin you're going to be doing. I heard a preacher say one time before, said to us, us uh, let me, oh, I don't get it right. Uh, this book is uh, keep you from sin, but without this book you will be completely in sin. It's like it keeps you from it or it drags you to it, one or the other. You got to you stay away from this book, you'll be in sin. You'll, you'll embrace sin. Stay in that book and the sin will be taken care of. It'll, it'll leave. In other words, you'll, you'll overcome it. But you got to have that book. You got to have that word in you for sure. He said in John 14, 16, he said, Ask of the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, will come to him and make our home with him. There it is. We are what? The temple of the Holy Spirit, right? We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. He made his home within us. Within us. Ongoing, continually. Carries on. And concluding this, you see in verses 20 and 21, he said, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. He's showing here the very last part of this. He's encouraging them with this prayer. He is laying out there words immeasurably to surpass anything we can ever think of. And, and not only that, more going over and beyond uh, of all we can imagine. Now look, we got pretty good imaginations, don't we? About what we think God can and cannot do or cannot do, whatever, right? We, our imaginations go wild, but we can't even imagine how much God is doing. How much God loves. How much God is doing. Even in our lives, sometimes you, you almost wish he'd pull that blinder back, right? And let you see what he's actually doing. Let you see that other world, if you will, and see what's happening around you. I have a feeling if we did, it might scare us to death right at first, but then we'd be going, man, God is really looking out for me. God is really taking care of me. And things I can't see, we just live through it and think, well, that's just a natural cause of things. No, it's his hand, right? He's moving, he's making things happen. He's moving things for us. All those things work out for the good of those who I love him, right? You may be going, like the, the, like the video said, you may be going through uh, a big-time trial right now, but he's moving you through that trial, and on the other side of it, right, on the other side, it will bring glory to him and will be it, not good for you, but it will change who you are. It will make you more like Christ. Those things come because he's using those to make our faith stronger, make us depend upon him stronger. Like I said, this Christian life, you and I know, it's not an easy walk. It's not going to be a small, you know, a nice, smooth path. These things are going to come up and happen to us called life. But how you handle them is determined by who's in control of your life. If your flesh is in control, you're going to blow up at them, right? You're going to tear apart everybody in your way. You're going to, but if the, the Spirit of God is in control, the Holy Spirit, when those things come, will stop. Instead of charging over or giving it our best fleshly way to take care of it, we'll stop and say, okay, God, what? What's going on? What, how do you want to do this? He may say walk around. He may say walk right straight through it. Go right through it. Trust me. Go right into it. I've got something to show you. And he'll do that in, the, in your life. Number one, we've got to understand he's able. And as he says, he's, who is able to do immeasurably more. How many of y'all know God is able? And just fill in the blank, right? He is able, he's able to do, he's able to do what? He's able to raise up children from stones. You see that in Luke 3, 8. Where he says that God will raise up these children from stone. He's, uh, Jesus arguing with the, the, uh, the, the uh, Pharisees. He said, we have, they said, we have Abraham as our father. He said, I tell you, out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Right? God can do that. He, he, he has the ability to raise up children from stone. He's able also to fulfill the promises. Even if they're humanly impossible, God can fulfill those promises. Being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Romans 4, 21. He can do what he's promised he will do. He has the power to do it. 
He has the power to make grace abound, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. To do immeasurably more, Ephesians 3, 20. We just read it right there. To bring everything under his control, Philippians 3, 21. You'll see that there. To guard the soul's treasure, 2 Timothy 1, 12. To save completely, amen? We're waiting on that day, aren't we, right? He said, Hebrews 7, 25 said, Therefore he's able to save completely those who come to God through him, through Christ, because he always lives to intercede for them. What's Christ doing for us right now? He's at the right hand of God doing what? Interceding, isn't he? he is, he's on our side. He's, he's interceding for us to save completely. And not only that, to keep from falling. God has the ability to keep you from falling. Jude one twenty four says that to him who's able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and without and with great joy. Jude one twenty four, God's going to preserve it. God's going to make it happen. God's going to preserve that joy. He's going to present us before him on that day. Amen. And he's going to see what the blood of Christ on us. He's not going to condemn us for that. He's going to judge us on our work. What do we do after we receive eternal life? I'm going to build up treasures in heaven. I'm not going to have anything there at all. That's what you're going to be judged on. That's what you're, not your salvation, but judged on what you did with it. He answers those prayers. Matthew 19, 26 says, Jesus looked at him and said, With man, this stuff is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. One last word about that. The purpose in what God is doing in answering prayer it's not that we are going to make a name for ourselves, not that we're going to build great cathedrals and great churches, but that through the church, what might happen? He might be glorified in the church through Christ Jesus. You and I, our existence here right now is not about ourselves. It's about what? Glorifying him. I said last week or a week before, the sermon was about the church, main identity of what was going on with the church, is to show God's glory to who? The spirits, Right? the dominions, the powers of the air, to show God's glory to them through us. Now, believe it or not, me and you are actually responsible for showing God's glory. How are we going to do that? By how we obey him, right? By the obedience, by the way we follow him. We're showing all the dominions, all the spirits of the air, everything that's been created long before us, and the powers and principalities of this air are watching us, the church, give God glory. And even the holy angels in heaven are awed at what's going on. They look at us and go, wow, look what God is doing. That's impossible to get a Jew and a Gentile to get along and bring them and make one person out of. How do you do that? That's amazing, right? Well, trust me, in 2022, the angels could be watching us right now going, that is absolutely amazing. Things are falling out, falling off, falling apart all around them. From their country to whatever. And they are cool, calm, and collective. How is that, God? It's my glory. My glory through them. They trust me, not the circumstances around them. That is why they still have their joy. That is why they still walk by faith. That is why they see everything come crumbling around. And they do not fear that. Because my joy, I'm in them. And the angel's are like, Wow. Right? The powers and principalities of the air are like, wow, look at this. We can't see it because we're still living in this. But we are the glory of God upon us. He's, he's getting his glory done. He's getting glory from us, the church, for all the powers and principalities to see. We are giving God the glory. He set us here to do that. He set us here to go and tell all of his glory, all of his kingdom within the church. You're part of it. You're important, aren't you? Because God's using you. It's weird that God set that up. Not only that, he also sets up evangelism in the hands of us who are very frail and very fickle about it. But there's no plan B, is there? Go do it. Go tell. Don't have a plan B. It's up to us. It's up to saved humanity to go after lost humanity, bottom line. And the Holy Spirit will draw them. So I encourage you. In that, I encourage you in this one last verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now, hear that. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Nothing's going to come your way that the power of God can't keep you standing up under. Nothing's going to crush you, right? It may come, may feel like it's about to crush you, but God says, just stand up. 
stand up. Not in our own power, in his power. We need to understand that it's all about him, not about us. Amen? We're in that kingdom because he chose us to be there. We're in that state because he, cho he called us to do that. We received. We have been given that, that great responsibility after coming in to stand. When things start crushing us down, stand up under his power. And let his power rule and reign in us. You want to know the fullness of God? Surrender. Die to self. Crucified with Christ. Yet we live, but not us that live. Christ lives in us. Amen? And walk that way, you'll walk in that kind of power. You'll understand the fullness of God. You'll understand the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life and the power that comes with that to live the abundant life here and now. I challenge you, do it. Do it and see what happens. Amen? Let me pray for you guys and let y'all go. Let it for a place called